بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرا بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الانسان من علق اقرا وربك الاكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الانسان ما لم يعلم An explanation of Kitab Al-Tawheed Amen al-Rasul bima unzil ilayhi min rabbihi wal-mu'minun Presented by Abu Hasnayn Murtaza Khan Qul hadihi sabili ad'u ila Allahi ala basiratin ana wa man ittaba'ani Produced and distributed by Knowledge, Books and Audio As you find in the hadith Ijtanibu wa sab al-mubiqat Stay away from the seven destructive sins And then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated Al-ishraku billah wa sihar He stated to commit shirk with Allah And then straight away he mentioned magic The only way you can get through magic is to go through the practice of shirk is to go in committing association or making partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like as you find among some of the final ahadith that he mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la taturuni don't praise me like the nasara praised ibn maryam innama ana abd indeed i'm only a servant so say that i am the servant of Allah and the messenger of Allah بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلل فلا حاد له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة دلالة وكل دلالة في النار رب شرح لي صدري ويسد لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Now we come to the chapter uh, discussing those people who claim to know the unseen through the reading of the cuff, the reading of the hand or palmistry, the reading of the finjan, reading of the the remnants of what remains in the cup, what they call tea leaf reading. And that quite strange is you drink a cup of tea and then whatever's left they read through and discuss your future, your life through this reading and other aspects of claiming to have knowledge of the unseen. As for Al-Ghayb, Al-Ghayb the Unseen is a matter of belief, or one of the pinnacle points of belief for the believer. At the beginning of the Qur'an after Surah Al-Fatiha, that you find the sifat, the characteristics of the believers. You find Al-Ladina Yu'minuna bil Ghayb, the people who believe in the Unseen. So the Ghayb, the Unseen, is what the believers believe in. And that knowledge only lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, ma ghaba anin nas, that which is not present in front of mankind, that which is, they do not have knowledge of, min al umur al mustaqbila wal maadiyya wa ma la yarawnahu, regarding those affairs that will come in the future, that which has happened in the past, and that which they don't know. That is basically the unseen. So, anything that will happen inside the future, the the coming of the final wars, the fit and the trials and the tribulations, that in many of the books of Ahadith you always find a chapter dedicated to Kitab al Fitan, the book of trials and tribulations that will fall upon this Ummah towards the end of time. And likewise that in great detail what happened in the past, we don't know much of that which occurred in the past except for that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrated inside the Quran or that which has been narrated by the Prophet Muhammad through the revelation given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
وقد اختص الله تعالى بعلمه الله سبحانه وتعالى has given this knowledge or attributed the knowledge of the unseen to himself قل لا يعلم من في السماوات والأرض الغيب إلا الله none knows the knowledge of the heavens and the earth or the hidden affairs of the heavens and the earth إلا الله except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is in Surah Al-Namal 27th chapter verse number 65 however you find that some aspects of the unseen are sent down to his messengers that certain attributes of the unseen are sent down upon them or some knowledge is given to them عَالِمُ الْغَيْبِ لَا فَلَا يُظْهِرُ عَلَى غَيْبِهِ أَحَدًا he is the one who knows the unseen the knower of the unseen فَلَا يُظْهِرُ عَلَى غَيْبِهِ أَحَدًا none has the ability to manifest or to know the unseen except for him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala إِلَّا مَنِ ارْتَدَى مِنْ رَسُولِ except for whoever he pleases or chooses from amongst his messengers so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bestow some knowledge of the unseen to his messengers these messengers can be al-malaki or al-bashari can be an angel or it can be a human being that some knowledge is given down the human being is none other than the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that some aspects of the unseen have been given to them the unseen which is given to them is not غيب المطلق there's two aspects of the unseen one is the total knowledge of the unseen and that which is the restricted knowledge of the unseen the restricted knowledge has been given to some of the prophets that some of the things that will befall them or will happen has been given to them as for ghaybul mutlaq the total unseen only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why this is a point of aqeedah and belief because some of the deviant people unfortunately they like to attribute to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he knows not the restricted unseen, he knows غيب المطلق he knows the total unseen he has the knowledge of the last day and he has the knowledge of other aspects which only belong strictly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these aspects of the unseen in general إن الله عنده علم الساعة إن الله عنده علم الساعة to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the knowledge of the hour وَيُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْثَ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْأَرْحَامِ وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَاذَا تَكْسِبُ غَدَا وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ وَيُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْثَ he is the one that sends down the rain. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْأَرْحَامِ And he knows that which is inside the womb of the mother. وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَاذَا تَكْسِبُ غَدَى And no soul knows what it will earn tomorrow. وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ The end of Surah Luqman. The 31st chapter, verse number 34. So these are the affairs of the unseen. None knows the knowledge of the hour. The only thing that we know, it will be on the day of Yawmul Jum'ah. The day of Friday will be the coming of the hour. As for the total knowledge of how it will happen and what will take place, only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْثِ He is the one that sends down the rain. So when a weatherman claims to know the knowledge of the rain, ulama have responded to this. That they only have a restricted knowledge of the rain, seeing the movements of the clouds and the satellite systems that they have to observe. As for where every single drop will drop, how long will it rain for, what will it destroy, what will it give life to, that knowledge only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْأَرْحَامِ Knows that which is inside the womb of the mother. They can claim that they know the sex of the child. But as for the total knowledge of the child when it will grow up, whether it will be sa'id or shaqi, whether it be sad or happy, in a state of contentment, at peace, rich or poor, all this divine knowledge and what will be the end of that individual only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَاذَا تَقْسِبُ غَدًا And no soul knows what it will earn tomorrow. Yes, people may know that a certain wealth or salary is coming to them. But the final knowledge that at a split of a second, it could be the end of al-insan, the end of what they earn, and that money could not be placed inside their hand. Like I defined, وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ be ayi ardin tamut, and no soul knows which land it will die in. No soul has any knowledge 
will be his final place on this dunya. So you find that these people who claim to know the unseen through the use of palmistry or the reading of cups or soothsayers or magic or astrology, these people are liars. And likewise, they are kafirs. They are disbelievers in these people who seek this knowledge and claim to have knowledge of the unseen. The only knowledge of the unseen which is allowed is that which was given to the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even the prophets, or the final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, he stated, or the Qur'an narrates this inside the Qur'an, that if he knows the total unseen, why does the Qur'an state, قُلْ لَا أَمْلِكُ لِنَفْسِ نَفْعًا وَلَا ضَرَّا Say to these people, I hold, no, I possess no benefit or harm to myself. إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ Except for that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. وَلَكُنْتُ أَعْلَمُ الْخَيْبِ If I knew the unseen, لَسْتَكْثَرْتُ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ وَمَا مَسَّنِي أَسُوْ And no harm would have come upon me إِنْ أَنَا إِلَّا نَذِيرٌ وَبَشِيرٌ لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, I'm only a wuna and one who's giving glad tidings لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ For people to believe. Surah Al-A'raf, the seventh chapter, verse 188. This is one of the greatest evidences of the Qur'an that if the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew the unseen. Why is the Quran itself stating, "Kulla amliku li nafsi nafam wala darra"? I hold no form possession of harm or goodness for my own self. If I did know the unseen, then I would have gathered that goodness myself. When his own family was tortured and persecuted, when seventy of his companions were ambushed and killed, if he knew the unseen, don't you think he would have intervened to save them? If he knew what was going to happen to his wife Khadija by living in that valley, he would have tried to move from that location. All this shows that the total knowledge of the unseen was not known by the Prophet Muhammad And likewise we find that even the jinn, some people believe that the jinn have the knowledge of the unseen. This also has been mentioned inside the Quran. فَلَمَّا خَرَّ تَبَيَّنَتِ الْجِنِّ أَلَّوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ الْغَيْبِ مَا لَبِثُوا فِي الْعَذَابِ الْمُهِينِ Inside Surah to Saba, the 34th chapter, verse number 14. That we read the tafsir of these ayah talking about Sulaiman alayhi salam. That whereby he had the control of the jinn. This is a kingdom that was only given to Sulaiman alayhi salam. That he has been given the ability to control the jinn. And they used to dive in the ocean for him and extract the pearls. And they are the ones that are constructing the great masjid. Or that which people claim at the moment is Solomon's temple. In, in fact it was a masjid in its essence. Not a temple. So they were building this, constructing this masjid for him. And what happened to this jinn? That he would, if you read the tafsir of this surah and this ayat, that he was watching them resting on his staff, resting on his stick, sitting on his throne, watching them. And every time they looked up, they thought, strange is Sulaiman alayhi salam. He doesn't seem to rest forever, watching us every single movement that we do. Until eventually that you find, ta'kuludabba, that the earth, the, the worm, or the insect, the wood lice, or the wood insects that eat wood, began to eat away at his stick. And then when that began to move slowly, it eventually collapsed. And Sulaiman salam with his eyes open, because every time they noticed his eyes were open, they thought he was still alive. When he collapsed on the floor, then the jinn stated, فَلَمَّا خرى, When he fell down, تَبَيَّنَتِ jinn. It became clear to the jinn, أَلَّوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ الْغَيْبِ مَا لَبِثُوا فِي الْعَذَابِ الْمُهِينِ If they had known the unseen, they would not remain forever serving many years under the command of Sulaiman salam. So even the jinn don't know the unseen. They stated clearly, we would not want to live in this evil chastisement or being slaves or servants towards any Sulaiman alayhi salam. So these are the evidences from the Qur'an that none has the knowledge of the unseen. And those people who claim through the use of palmistry and soothsaying saying and astrology, then these people or the use of Ba'dul al-Mush'awwideen with the Jaleen, some of these magicians and these false liars, these people are none other who tell you that something has been lost and where to find it, or tell you about things which are not present in front of you. These people are very dangerous people, and people who are none other than disbelievers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find that these people, that some of them use al khida' wa tablis. Some of them use a form of trickery and deception. That's how you find like the works of tablis, iblis, of Ibn Qayyim or Ibn al-Jawzi, who writes about the devil's deception. That some magic is true. And other forms of this type of knowing the unseen is through trickery. And we find that the Qur'an, uh, the Qareen aids them to such a degree. 
that you find that every person has a qareen, a companion with them. And this qareen, يَأْتِهِ shaytan bi atima. The shaytan will bring them with food and fruits and good sweet things. وَغَيْرْ ذَلِكْ مِمَّا لَا يَكُونُ فِي ذَلِكَ الْمَوْدِعِ That would not exist in that location. So maybe living in this land, maybe bring fresh dates from Medina or from another country which you know that don't exist in this country. Or bring other sweet objects that don't exist in this country. It's all for the use of the jinn to bring these substances in front of you. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يُطِيرُ بِهِ الْجِنِّ إِلَى مَكَّةً And some of them you find that when you discuss with these people, they say, I just went and I offered my prayer in Mecca and I came back. That is none other than the jinn who takes them over to Mecca and then brings them back again. Or Bayt al-Maqdas, or has performed a prayer inside the noble Masjid al-Aqsa around that area. And we find that these people, that they use the stars. The use of astronomy or astrology is nothing but superstitious. A superstitious nature that you find that many people begin to look into the reading of the stars, etc., to find out what will happen to them. And we find that many people go to them, and people get married by this star, or travel according to this star, or the movement of this star. And the Mufassirun have clearly highlighted, as one of the students, Qatada, one of the students of Imam Mujahid, who was a student of Ibn Abbas, he stated there's only three purposes of the stars. That the stars that we find, there's only three purposes. And this is a classical understanding which we find that even exists today. The first reason of the reason of the stars being there is zina, is beautifications of the heavens. There is a form of beauty of the skies at night that you find that the stars are placed there. The second is meteorites, is stones to be thrown upon the shayateen. That the throwing of them when they come there to seek news from the heavens, and the talk of the, of the angels, then these meteorites the, or the stars come down and thrown upon them. And the third reason, وَبِن نَجْمِ هُمْ يَحْتَدُونَ And by the stars, they are guided. Meaning that it's signs for the travelers. That the people who travel in the ocean and travel on the land in the dark night, they know through the movement of the stars or the location of the stars that this is the way that we travel. And any other person who brings any other meaning of the stars, then they have gone away from the classical meaning of the usage of the stars. And that brings us through that وَمَنِ الدَّعِي الْمُلْغَيْبِ أَوْ صَدَّقَ بِهِ أَوْ صَدَّقَ مَنْ يَدَّعِيهِ فَهُوَ مُشْرِكْ كَافِرِ Whoever claims to have knowledge of the unseen, and whoever testifies that person having knowledge of the unseen, then that individual is a mushrik, one who associates partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and likewise he is a kafir, or she is a disbeliever. That don't ever testify to a person who claims to have knowledge of the unseen. If you do, then that individual who claims to have the knowledge of the unseen is a disbeliever, and you to testify to that individual have become a disbeliever as well. And closely linked to this that we find, that many of these actions that these people do of the unseen, are linked carefully or very closely to shaitan. لِأَنَّهَا أَمُورْ الشَّيْطَانِيَ muharrama. That these people do these actions of sihr, of magic, wal-kahana, wal-fortune telling, wal-arrafa, of uh, sood saying, are all linked to the shaitan. And all of this destroys your aqidah. It destroys your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or it makes your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very deficient. لِأَنَّهَا لَا تَحْصُلْ إِلَّا بِأُمُورْ shirkiya. And none of these affairs come about except for you committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is knowledge that this individual gains, or through fortune telling, of sood saying, whatever they use, masses of these people have taken that knowledge through committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why it goes back to Tawheed. That people may think, what is the link between Tawheed and the person who's looking in a crystal ball? Or reading a person's hand. But these people to gain this knowledge have performed some acts of shirk, of associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise the person who believes in them begins to believe in that individual or the things that they tell them to do. For sihr is that which is hidden. Magic is that which is hidden from you. لِأَنَّهُ يَحْصُلْ بِعْمُورْ خَفِيَّةً It takes place through hidden affairs. That the way that the people conduct themselves in the use of magic, لَا تُدْرِكْ بِالْأَبْصَارِ Cannot be seen by the naked eye. The things that they, these people do, the incantations that they make, the mantra or the speech that they use, yani the use of smoke, and all of this, and medicine that they use, it begins to affect the person medically on their body, and even some forms of magic delve down deep into the heart as well. 
And the evidence has been clearly highlighted in the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That you read the Tafsir of Al Mu'awwidatain, Surah Al Falaq and Surah Al Nas. That the reason for the revelation is because somebody done magic on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But a magic could not overcome him. Rather, it made his heart feel weighty and heavy. It did not overtake him and take him away from ibadah because he was under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Wallahu yasimu kamin al nas. Allah subhanahu wa taala will protect you from mankind. And that's why we find that even in the hadith that we find. Or before that, we find that the effect of magic of, upon your heart and sickness on your body. And likewise, you find where you farrik bain al mar'i wa zawjihi. That the magic can make you split or leave your wife. That many forms of magic have been designed that people delve into black magic to split people in their relationships. The use of this magic to bring about hatred between the husband and the wife. Wa ta'thiruhu bi itnillahi ta'ala. And its effect only comes by the permission of the leave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa huwa amal shaytani. Whoever deals in the use of magic, it is the action or the work of none other than the cursed shaytan. And that's how we find that these actions, these evil actions or filthy actions, are linked to shirk. Are linked closely to shirk. As we find in the hadith, اجتنبوا السبع المبقات Stay away from the seven destructive sins. Seven destructive sins. And then the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ stated, الإشراك بالله والسحر He stated to commit shirk with Allah, and then straight away he mentioned magic. So the seven destructive sins. The first is to commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then straight after that is to commit magic. The only way you can get through magic is to go through the practice of shirk. Is to go in committing association or making partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's two ways that shirk, uh, magic is linked with shirk from two angles. The first angle that magic is linked to shirk is because you use the use of shaitan in getting closer to him. Not close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you use shaitan to get closer to him. Because for sihr min ta'alim shayateen. Magic is from the teachings of the devil. So you're not getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are getting closer to shaitan. So this is one way that you are committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he himself subhanahu wa ta'ala stated, وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحَرِ Indeed, the devils have committed, have disbelieved, يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحَرِ They teach people magic. So magic is only from shaitan, the teaching of magic. And the second way that is linked to shirk is because you're claiming to have knowledge of the unseen. That is, person who deals inside magic claims to have some aspects of the unseen. وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لِمَنْ اشْتَرَاهُ مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ Indeed, these people, they know what they are trying to earn, that they have no knowledge of the unseen, or no portion of the unseen. That's what these people are trying to buy. That we have knowledge that this is what's going to happen to you, so you need to stay away from this. This is claiming knowledge of the unseen. And once again, we mention that this only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from these two angles, a person who delves inside magic is committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find that the punishment of the magician is to be killed. فَقْتُلُ sahir is the punishment according to the sharia that the individual who delves inside magic and the use of magic should be killed. For some people, they classify magic as a fan min al-funun, as a skill or an art from the skills that you find at the moment. Because previously you would find that people who delve inside music and dance and these type of etiquettes, people look down upon them. Not just the non-Muslims, but the Muslims firstly and the non-Muslims as well, will not regard this as a, as a profession of respect. If you read the Victorian ages, that a woman to display her body was classified as an act of treason. That a woman who displayed herself in a semi-nude manner was punished according to the law as being in an immoral manner. But obviously this has changed over time. And that's why we find that these people classify the, the, the revealing of a woman's body as a skill and as art now. And likewise magic was classified as a major sin and still is a major sin. But for some people amongst the non-Muslims or masses of them, and unfortunately many of the Muslims believe that this is a skill that you learn. And people's, people would attend such functions. Thousands would attend to watch acts of the supernatural 
or a person doing magic in front of them. And the ulama have stated, it is forbidden for an individual to attend the functions of magicians. That a Muslim should not attend functions of people who deal in magic. The second thing that we find is al-kahana wal arrafa People who deal in fortune telling and soothsaying. That these people also claim to have knowledge of the unseen. And things which have been lost and things about that happened before previously. And all of this knowledge has been through and tariq istikdam al shayateen has been taken about through the use of the shaytan to bring about this knowledge to them. Hal unabbikum ala man tanazzalu shayateen. Should I not inform you upon who the shayateen come down upon? Who does the shaytan come down upon? Tanazzalu ala kulli affakin athim comes upon every single lying treacherous person. يُلْقُونَ السَّمْعَ وَأَكْثَرُهُمْ كَاذِبُونَ is the one they give ear to him or give the knowledge to him وَأَكْثَرُهُمْ كَاذِبُونَ and the mass of them are liars. That is the shayateen that comes down upon them only comes upon these weak people and the knowledge which is displayed towards these people has no value at all. And we find that when you read the tafsir of how these people or how the shayateen snatch the knowledge or the jinn takes the knowledge is because one word from the speech of the angels is heard by them. As they go up to the heavens, they snatch only one kalima, snatch one word, that which can be described as even Chinese whispers. They take one word, and then they bring it down, and they add many words to it. And then they give it to the person who deals in sood saying, and reading of the crystal ball, and reading of all these things, and that individual adds a hundred lies to it. And it makes a whole complete story. And the only thing that the human nature unfortunately is, is out of all of the 99 lies that the individual has just told you, that the one thing that they told you, that you're going to see a person wearing an orange jumper walk in front of you early in the morning, that unfortunately comes in front of you and you begin to believe that individual. When you forget all about the rest of the 99 trash that they've told you, but a one thing just by mere chance happens to come true, or something happens and you begin to take that in. Only one kalima that they snatch from the angels, and even that one word is out of context, and then they add many words to it, and by the time it reaches this dunya, then many things have been mixed to it. And people begin to believe in these people. Well, kahana la takhlu min shirk. And Sud saying, and this type of behavior is not free from shirk. The first aspect of these people is shirk fi rububiyya. Is shirk in the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the, the earth and the command only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise, fil uluhiyya, in his ibadah. That these people have to dedicate something to gain that information. The shayateen don't give you that knowledge for free. They tell you to do something for them. Even when people are possessed by the jinn, that many people will commit shirk to relieve that jinn. And this is well known, that many of the jinn that enter people are committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, amongst the Hindus, uh, amongst from the, from the Hindus, from the other people who commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fire worshippers, and they enter into that body. And then when you begin to extract that jinn, and the people who don't have a clear understanding of Iman, the jinn will say to them, slaughter this sheep, or slaughter this animal, in the name of such and such God. And then when that individual does that, that jinn will leave that body. And everybody is rejoicing that the jinn has left the body. In fact, you have committed the greatest sin on this earth. The greatest sin in the heavens and the earth, Allah wa hiya al billahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. The jinn has left that individual's body, but you sacrificed in the name of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is the reason why the jinn left that body. That's why those people who talk about or know the signs of extracting the jinn, they will never ever tell you to sacrifice in the name of an individual. Go and find strange, strange substances like the head of a crocodile and bring it in front of them. Those people who know these people, they delve into such sciences. But the real form to, to, to is to attack the jinn through the use of the Qur'an, through the recitation of the Qur'an that the jinn begins to burn, till eventually they have to submit. And you read the science of removing the jinn, that you find that these ulama would tie the toes of the individual, or tie the fingers, so the jinn cannot extract, cannot leave, and continuously burn them with the Qur'an, because the Qur'an burns them. And they scream and they shout, that stop the recitation of the Qur'an. And that is when the alim would threaten them, that either you leave this individual, or I will carry on reciting the Qur'an, until eventually I will burn you. And that is the greatest power, the tool of the Qur'an upon these evil jinn that we find. And we find, مَنْ أَتَى كَاهِنًا 
فصدقه بما يقول فقد كفر بما انزل على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم whoever comes to a fortune teller or a soothsayer whoever comes to an individual and testifies that that individual is telling you the truth فقد كفر بما انزل على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم you have committed disbelief upon that which was sent down to the prophet muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم curiosity killed the cat for even for one second to go and say let me just go and show my hand to this individual let me go read the stars let me go ask this person who claims to have this knowledge you have committed kufr bima unzila ala muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam you have committed disbelief in that which was sent down upon the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's not something to be taken lightly that even the muslim empire you find clearly that signs and symbols are placed in muslim lands that come to us and we will read your hand and give you knowledge of that which will happen to you in the future and other people that we find deal with this form through the use of medics for the use of medicine that a person in a state of sickness that you would go to that individual and if people may be in the disguise of doctors and you find these leaflets that are given through the household at the moment that you have this problem that problem come to us for the use of medicine these people are also committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will tell you to sacrifice things and to obtain things to remove that harm from you or to bring some goodness upon you and like what you find that some of these people will talk about finding a lost property if you've lost something in your home or if you've lost something we will search for it and find it for you these people are once again dealing with the shayateen or dealing with the devils and then you find the pious individuals that people believe that the awliya that we don't believe in them indeed we believe in the awliya الا ان اولياء الله لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون الذين امنوا وكانوا يتقون indeed the awliya of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those people amanu wa kanu yattaqun who believe and they have consciousness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what is taqwa as many of the ulama have highlighted it is to stick to the halal and to stay away from the haram that is a sign of a wali how can a person be a wali who keeps himself in a bad state doesn't pray doesn't fast doesn't observe anything lives in the jungle eating leaves in a state of filthiness and then you claim this is an individual who is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is not the criteria according to the Quran the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun don't fear and they don't grieve alladhina amanu who believe wa kanu yattaqun who have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so these people who claim to have natural supernatural powers or they go against the laws of not nature but the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and many of these individuals are only going through the use of trickery the many of these people a sheikh sabi bin taymi has highlighted that they claim to walk through uh, walk through the fire the khul fin na enter into the fire and many times what they are using is only trying to trick the people amongst them there are some who have used the jinn to protect them while walking through the fire but some of them have used trickery a sheikh sabi bin taymi he highlights a debate that he had with one of them and he talks about how he knew that this person was using a form of trickery and he said to him look i know that you are using a form of trickery and i want you to bathe yourself i want you to wash yourself and to remove everything that you are wearing and the man refused and only took off his shirt and he said no i want you to wash yourself with the, with this substance because he highlights that this person took the, the fat of the frog and placed it on his body so that when he would walk through the fire then no harm would come upon him So he designed a special fireproof substance to take himself through the fire. Sheikh Sabi bin Taymiyyah knew that this individual and he had placed this substance upon him. So he told him to bathe himself and to remove the substance which is not visible and then told him to walk into the fire. And then even challenged him after that and said that we don't talk about the fire. Let us place our finger inside the, the clay oven or a fire. I'll play, place my finger and you place your finger. And indeed this man refused at this stage because the substance had been removed from him. He did not have the courage now to place his hand inside the fire. But however, there are some of them who do deal with the power of the jinn to maybe, as we may visualize, these people may show us of flying through the sky and going deep down into the oceans and coming out when they've been placed inside shackles and chains and escaping out of freedom. This is only the use of the shayateen and the devils. And very closely to this, that we find that the way that these people get close to the devils and the shayateen. is also that we find the offering of sacrifices the offering of sacrifices of animals at the tombs and graves and praising the people who are buried inside the graves that people in a state 
that we don't encourage visiting of the graves. Indeed, a person should visit the graves because it reminds you of death. Hadimul Ladzat, the destroyer of pleasures. By the way, that these people have perceived the understanding of the graves. Islam is a deen which lays down maqasid, lays down principles and protections and purposes of our life in this dunya. And the principles that we find are very, yani the dawabit, the principles that we find are very severe about the codification of the graves. The way that the graves need to be constructed and the way they need to be visited have all been highlighted in the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The codification that we find amongst them we find أَنَّهُ قَدْ حَذَّرَ صلى الله عليه وسلم من الغلوف الأولياء والصالحين Indeed, the first thing that we find before we even enter into the grave is that he warned excessive praise of the awliya, of the pious people and the salihin. Those who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the righteous individuals. Before we even enter into the grave to excessively praise people. إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغُلُو Upon you is to avoid excessive praise of an individual. فَإِنَّمَا أَحْلَكَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلُكُمْ الْغُلُو Indeed, that which destroyed the people before you was ghulu, excessive praise of that individual. Like I define among some of the final ahadith that he mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, la taturuni, don't praise me like the Nasara praised Ibn Maryam. Innama ana abd, indeed I am only a servant, so say that I am the servant of Allah and the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was amongst his final words. And that is said at the final stages of his life. They don't praise me in an excessive manner. Indeed, I am the messenger of Allah and only his servant. Second, we find, وَحَذَّرَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ مِنَ الْبَنَاءِ عَلَى الْقُبُورِ The second thing he highlighted is to build upon the graves. To build any form of construction upon the graves. As we find that the companion he narrates, قَالَ لِي عَلِي ibn أَبِي طَالِب The Ali ibn Abi Talib stated to this individual, Should I not say to you the words, that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said to me, Should I not send you with that which he sent me with? He sent me with the command, Allah tada timthalan illa tamastuhu. Don't leave any statue or anything raised except for that you flattened it out and made it level to the earth. Wala qabran, any grave that is on a high rank, illa sawaitahu, except that you brought it level to the ground as well. So this is something that the Prophet Muhammad sent Ali bin Abi Talib to do. So it's got nothing to do. This is the movement of Wahhabiya. That the people who don't believe in the graves, they develop this. The essence of this call is the essence of Tawheed. The essence of this call goes back to the ahadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Naha Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an tajsisul qabr. In the codification or in the ramification of the strengthening of the grave. وَأَنْ يَقَدْ عَلَيْهِ Or to sit on the grave وَأَنْ يُبْنَ عَلَيْهِ بَنَاءً Or to build anything on the grave. Etiquettes of the grave have been highlighted. To cement the grave. And to sit on the grave. That some people, when they visit the graveyard and they're burying an individual, they may sit on the grave. This is a sign of disrespect to sit on the grave with another individual. To be careful on where you tread inside the graveyard. And many of our brothers take these things lightly. That doesn't make a difference. Some people even unfortunately begin, as I've visualized myself, to begin to smoke in the graveyard or to sit there and talk about futile things and to read the newspaper. There are two signs that can be taken from this. One, there is no ihtiram for the person who died. There is no value for the person who died. So people just attend there as the sheep attend the grazing of the grass. Just have a formality. And the other thing that we can learn is these people themselves are taking no heed from the visiting of the graves. And that's why we need to all be focused that we need to bear in mind the etiquette of visiting of the graveyard. The third thing that we find, وَحَذَّرَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ إِنْدَ الْقُبُورِ He forbade us or warned us to not to take the, the graveyard as a place of prayer. Person should not offer their prayer inside the area of the graveyard. أَلَا وَإِنَّ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ كَانُوا يَتَّخِذُونَ قَبُورَ أَنْبِيَاءٍ مَسَاجِدِ Indeed those people before you used to take the graves of the Anbiya as a masajid, as a place of prayer or a building. And indeed, فَلَا تَتَّخِذُ الْقُبُورِ masajid. Don't take the graves as a place of masajid. What is the meaning of masajid here? وَاتِّخَادُهَا masajid مَعْنَهُ الصَّلَاءِ indaha. The meaning of masajid here is the meaning of to offer the prayer. That a person should not pray 
where the graves are. So the graveyard is not a place of prayer. And likewise we find that every single فَكُلُّ مَوْضِ قَصْتُ لِسَّلَى فِيهِ فَقَدِ تَخَدَ مَسْجِدًا And every time you offer your prayer, that place becomes your masjid. You offer a prayer in that place, that area is classified as a masjid. There doesn't need to be a great big building of a masjid. As you find the hadith, جُعِلَتْ لِي الْأَرْضُ مَسْجِدًا وَتُهُورًا Indeed, the whole of the earth has been made a masjid, as a place of prayer. Wherever you stand and pray, becomes your masjid. So meaning that if you go into the masjid and you offer the prayer there, you have taken that place as a masjid and the person is forbidden to do that. And then we find the words of Al-Allama Ibn Al-Qayyim al jawziya who was a student of Shaykh Usama ibn Taymiyyah. And these words are mentioned many, many centuries ago. And he states that these people, whoever collects the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, regarding the graves, وَمَا أُمِرَ بِهِ And whatever he, he has been commanded to do, and whatever he has been told to abstain from, وَمَا كَانَ عَلَيَّ أَصْحَابُهُ And whatever his companions were upon, وَبَيْنَ مَا عَلَيَّ أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ الْيَوْمِ And what the majority of people are doing today. These words are talking about many centuries ago, 600 or 700 years ago. And these are the words of Ibn Qayyim al jawziya what he highlights of what was taking place at the graves. If you collect all of the ahadith of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and you collect all of the actions of these people, what the people are doing, you find what the people are doing is contrary or contradictory to the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم. And you can find لا يجتمعان أبدا These two things cannot be brought together. The sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and these innovations that these people are doing. Because we find that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, forbade us from offering the prayer at the graves. وَهَاُولَاءِ يُسَلُّونَ عِنْدَهَا And these people offer the prayer at the graves. It's the first thing that they go against the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad وَنَهَا أَنِ اتِّخَادَهَا مَسَاجِدْ He forbade it from taking it as a place of masjid. These people take it as a place of prayer. وَهَاُولَاءِ يُبْدُونَ عَلَيْهَا الْمَسَاجِدِ These people build masjids upon graves, which is clearly visualized. وَيُسَمُّونَهَا مَشَاهِدْ And these people classify that these places are symbols for mankind. If we reflect between those words of so many centuries ago and what people are doing at the moment of the graves, you find the people are doing the same thing. وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Majority of people don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except for that they commit shirk with Him, commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ثُمَّ أَخَذَ يُذْكَرْ تِلْكَ الْمَفَاسِدِ Then he begins to mention the corruption of what this leads to in taking of these graves and these places of respect. إِلَىٰ أَنْ قَالَ وَمِنْهَا That whatever the Prophet Muhammad s.a.w. lay down the vision of the graves in the ziyarat al-qubur إِنَّمَا هُوَ تَذَكْرُ الْآخِرَةِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ إِلَى الْمَزْرُورِ That the, this, this uh, visiting of the graves is تَذْكِرَةُ الْآخِرَةِ is a reminder of the hereafter وَالْإِحْسَانِ to the one that you are visiting بِالدُّعَى لَهُ وَالتَّرَحْهُمْ عَلَيْهِ وَالْإِسْتِغْفَارِ is for you to show mercy and compassion to that individual who has died and to pray for that individual. As for what's happening at the moment, is the opposite. That is no real form of prayer of supplication and goodness being shown to that individual. Instead that we find that a person is only causing harm upon themselves in this dunya and the akhirah. And that's how we find that when these people begin to offer the sacrifices on the graves and to give things on the graves, this is classified a shirk akbar. This is a major shirk and a deficiency in the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because many of these people, that even to such a degree, the ulama have highlighted the people of Ahlul Ilm should not stand at graves and raise their hands in prayer. Should not stand with these juhal, with these ignorant people, that when other people witness them, that they begin to state that Shaykh Fulan or Allan Fulan stood there, then this action is justified. The people should be clear upon this. Because many people, these juhal, these ignorant people, feel that the individual in the grave will benefit them and harm them. And harm and benefit only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And likewise you find that these people who begin to visit the grave and have what is classified as urs, a, a gathering that they have on a yearly basis, this is none other than the taking of an Eid. As you find the hadith, Allahumma la taj'al qabri wathanan yu'bad. Don't make my grave as a sanctity or a place which is worshipped after me. And that prayer 
has been preserved for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that his grave is not taken as a place of worship. Even though these people of Ahlul Bid'ah, of innovation wal khurafat, try their utmost best that when they attend the grave of the Prophet Muhammad sallam, to say and to supplicate to him and to seek aid from him and to do all types of things. And we, yani, alhamdulillah, grateful yani, for those people, those ulama have stood out and highlighted the deviancy of these people and to prevent these people from standing there excessively. That when these people even face the grave, and they begin to supplicate. They are told that the Kaaba is the opposite direction. Because that is the etiquette of dua. To face the Kaaba. Now to stand there and raise your hands in front of the grave of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, Even though you could be praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is against the teachings and etiquettes of dua. That a person should turn around and face the other way. And pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise his rank. And to you know, alleviate any hardships that could be coming. Even though there is none that comes upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what is the hukum? Or the ruling of praising these graves, of placing any buildings upon, or upon these graves, or placing statues of remembrance, or places of remembrance of individuals. And we know that tamathil is jam timthal. A tamathil is statues, it is a plural of just a simple timthal. Wa huwa surah al mujassama. It is the taking of a, of a picture, or the building of a living statue, of either a human being, of an animal, or anything else that has a living soul inside it. And nusub fil asal, a stone, the essence of the stone according to the linguistics of the Qur'an, is the altar, is the stone that these people would sacrifice the animals, not in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the name of their gods and whatever they believed in. So when you begin to construct these statues and these stones, as a remembrance of the pious people, of the people that you love, this is forbidden. And this has been strongly forbidden. Even photography, the ulama, the consensus of the ulama, only, or the majority of the ulama have allowed, allowed photography for beneficial purposes. The finding of a lost individual, for passport services, for visas, for other driving lights, for other forms of ID and classification, photography has been allowed. As for this futile taking of pictures of individuals, etc., is very dangerous. The hadith that we find in Bukhari, ma khalaqtum, give life to that which you've created with your own hands. We don't need to go into a technical debate that the take flicking of a, of a camera is the use of technology. The essence is you're still using your hand. The, the sifting of the picture is used through the human hand. So these people go into a technical debate, what is the use of the hand? And the most classical opinion, and the most strongest opinion is that to the abstinence of the use of photography in that which is beneficial. And this highlights the point that the building of statues to remember people, this, this mountain in America, whereby the six or seven presidents of America have been carved into this mountain. This is what we're talking about, the building of statues. The building or the statue of Saddam Hussein that these people destroyed. This is haram in Islam, the building of uh, statues to remember an individual. And we find a shaddud tahrir, severe warning of photography to be placed to be drawn, to be placed on a garment, to be drawn on a wall, on any form of photography that you find, there is evidence highlighting to stay away from this. And to place the essence of all of this, the building of statues of remembrance, goes back to what? Goes back to, if you read Surah Nuh alayhi salam, if you go and remember and read the tafsir of how these statues became, that these are righteous people, were five righteous people, and shaitan is an individual of great strategy, of a long thinking capacity which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him. He didn't say to the people, worship these five righteous people. He said to them, build something in remembrance of them. Or initially made them salihin, righteous and make remembrance of them. And then when the next jeel came, the next generation came, as has been narrated by Ibn Abbas, if my memory serves me correct, Imam Rawahu Imam Bukhari in his Sahih. And he stated to them, that now build something to remember them. Don't worship that. Don't worship these statues and these locations. Just to remember them. And when centuries passed, what happened to the Juhal? What happened to the ignorant people? They began to worship those statues. And then when Nuh alayhi salam, he came and he told these people to abstain from that. What did these people begin to do? وَقَالُوا لَا تَذْرُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ وَلَا تَذْرُنَّ وَدًّا وَلَا سُوَعَ وَلَا يَغُوثَ وَيَعُوكَ وَنَسْرًا We are not going to leave uh, idols. We're not going to leave them. We're not going to leave what was the name of these righteous individuals that Ibn Abbas highlights. 
wala suwa'an wala yaghutha wa ya'uka wa nasra we not going to leave these five gods from five righteous individuals they become became five gods that these people used to worship in the time of nuh alayhi salam wa li hadha la'ana an-nabiy sallallahu alayhi wasallam al-musawwirin and that is why the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam cursed the people who make pictures wa akhbara annahum ashadd an-nas 'adhaban yawm al-qiyama and the most severe people will be punished in their judgment will be those people who deal in photography and those people who deal in the making of statues and in the making of pictures it's something that we need to bear in mind not look into the technical points that whatever people discuss ashadd an-nas 'adhaban yawm al-qiyama the most severe penalty and trial that will be given to those people on the day or judgment and like how you find another hadith wa akhbara anna al-malaika la tadkhul baytan fihi sura the angels will not enter into a house whereby there's pictures on display how can you expect the blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in your home where to have pictures inside your home angels don't enter a house where there's pictures if you read through the hadith that even a young dog a puppy dog was under the bed of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and jibril was standing outside the door refused to come in and the prophet muhammad sallam knew that there was a reason and he asked aisha radhiyallahu ta'ala anha what is it that's in the house and he said there's nothing there except for his young puppy dog and he said extract the dog that is preventing jibril alayhi salam from entering to the house and another hadith that you find that she displayed a cloth a blanket with a picture of a pegasus a a a horse with two wings and displayed that and he was enraged with anger and turned his head away turned his anger away and said you need to get rid of this or instead that we find a solution is given to rip it apart and use it as a stuffing of of the cushion these are the teachings of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we are surrounded by photography may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and those people have it to remove it from their homes if they have it on display that when they enter the house you are refusing the blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come into your own home by displaying the use of photography and that's why we find that all of this leads to some form of shirk in the future among some people that people begin to worship these pictures and that's how you find that people begin to kiss pictures it could be their loved ones that begin to kiss them in a form of remembrance at tadkira fil qalb remembrance of the salihin and good people is always inside your heart is remembrance of the actions of khair and the goodness that they done not by visualizing their formal picture and thinking about an individual and that's why we find that this opposition led them to shirk and led them to cause destruction to come upon them that the sending of the tufan the sending of the floods that came upon the people of nuh alayhi salam was because of the shirk that they committed which began from the essence of building of these statues fa inna awwal ash-shirk hadatha fil ard kana bi sabab nasab sur so the beginning of this first shirk that existed on this earth was through the building or the construction of these statues wa idha kana al-kuffar al-yawm and if the disbelievers ya'maluna hadha al-'amal and the kuffar and disbelievers carry out with this action today the taking of photography in the building of statues and remnants and buildings of their loved ones and of their leaders this does not justify the muslim should follow the same people as we find indeed man tashabbaha bi qaumin fa innahum minhum whoever imitates a people is from amongst them or he is fa huwa minhum or is from them aw kama qal sallallahu alayhi wasallam al hadith marahu abu dawood fi sunanihi so that highlights that we should not imitate these people that is their aqidah that is their belief to praise their people that they support and they love in this manner we should not follow that same thing because our aqida is a pure aqida a belief which is pure and that's why sometimes that you find that the debate about the removing of these statues in this land or this place the more and more you begin to reflect upon tawhid that that becomes to be the the clear stance the removing of these statues that people begin to worship should not exist in the land of islam even though that we find these people are given their hurriya their freedom to keep it within their own homes that's what many people fail to understand that according to the islamic law non muslims are free to worship whatever they want to worship inside their own homes but not free to come out in the open they are even given according to islamic law is how remarkable the sharia is that they are allowed to judge and govern by their own book and according to their own court and their own system under the islamic law then their affairs of marital divorce and relationship they can go to their own judges is how islamic law deals with them yet we live in a minority in this country and we're not even given access to our own laws and they talk about freedom of expression and humanity that when you live under our law we give you the right to govern according to your own law and now we live under your law you don't even give us the freedom 
to judge with that which is haq, that which is the truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq and ability to return back to the true essence of tawheed, to stay away from all forms of shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and associating partners with Him, to stay away from sood saying and fortune telling and horoscopes and astrology, finjan, the reading of cups, palmistry, anything, and to preserve our families to turn to these things. Because indeed, He is the only one who is Allah, and nafir He is the one that causes harm and He is the one that causes protection. That's why we find Tawheed has to be rasikh, has to be so penetrated into our heart that every time that we think, it is only by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever happens, the good and the harm that befalls upon us, is something that needs to be developed in our family as well. Not to turn to the awliya, to the righteous or to the salihin, or to turn to the grave or to turn to the dead, and to turn to these other forms of shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to feel that this is the solution. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place these words of our mizan of hasanat and make us meet him on that day with a pure heart and with righteous actions only seeking his pleasure all alone. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Barakallahu feekum.